best part of my job is actually seeing some of the impact that we have in communities, um, across clients and across um, the people that we're supporting um, with a whole range of different social mobility and skills and opportunity initiatives. And one of my uh, favourite initiatives has been working with a whole range of small businesses across the last year. So don't worry, you're not going to hear too much about what Lloyd's Banking Group is doing for us. It's really important that you here today understand a little bit more about our brilliant small businesses, hear a bit about their journey and how they've been using technology and innovation to grow. And for me, it's really important that we talk about the different meaning of growth. So it's not just about growing and scaling, growth mindset, how are things evolving over time. So I'm going to kick off by just coming to each of you to give a little bit of an introduction, if that's all right. So maybe if I can pick on you first, if that's OK. Sure. Hey, I'm John. Um, I work at Tagstar. Um, so Tagstar is a social proof messaging platform. Um, and what that means is we take crowd-based data from websites, typically retail and travel, and we promote that throughout the site to give people more information about products um, and give them levels of confidence. So you've probably seen our messaging at John Lewis, Argos, Very. Um, X people are looking at this right now. Um, X people have bought this since your last visit. And the goal really is to create an environment, a social environment that you have in store where you can see what people are buying, you can ask people questions, what's popular, and kind of embody that online to give people confidence to buy more and buy faster. Brilliant, thank you. Hi everyone, I'm so happy to be here today. And uh, Lois has helped me a lot throughout the, my time starting Humanity. And so Humanity is a ready to drink oat milk tea latte. It's actually right here. <laughs> and we're set up as a social enterprise. So we support well-being and sustainability initiatives. Right now we're selling around 60 stores in the UK. And we've also recently launched on Okado. What makes our tea lattes unique is that it's low sugar and low calorie and excludes any artificial flavors and emulsifiers and offers you a boost of natural energy without the crash of coffee caffeine. Brilliant, thank Amazing. you. Hi everyone, I'm Hainan from Why Hangry. Imagine you could book a chef within a few clicks. Why Hangry is Airbnb for chefs. Whether it's a birthday party, a Christmas dinner, or you're looking for a chef to cook your meal prep, we help you find the perfect chef for any occasion. We work with more than 500 chefs across the UK, and there are hundreds of millions of chefs globally who are working under poor conditions in extremely stressful commercial kitchens. As a platform, we help these chefs earn more money and work more flexibly by doing what they love, which is creating beautiful food and seeing people enjoy it in their homes. Brilliant, thank you. Finally, cool. David. Last but not least, my name's David. I'm representing Innovus Medical, which is a surgical simulation company use, utilizing augmented reality to essentially take the learning curve away from the patient, from us, and into a safe environment where surgeons are able to practice um, a particular operation and reduce and shorten that learning curve so that they're able to train to a competency much quicker. It means that they're able to provide better care to patients. And it also means because of the, the way that we approach um, uh, with an augmented reality s solution to this problem, and sticking to core values of accessibility, affordability, and functionality, we're actually able to, um, uh, to, to act as a, um, a means for people who are developing new devices for surgery to test and validate those devices within our simulators, as well as to be able to sell and distribute via our simulators. So it's B2C and B2B, focusing mainly on solving the problems within surgical training and beyond. Thank you. Brilliant, and hopefully some of you have had the opportunity to see some of uh, David's work in action upstairs. There was a bit of an interactive lab where you could try a bit of surgery yourself, which was really exciting. That was fun. But, um, <laughs> but delighted, because we've got such a broad range of businesses here today, and deliberately so. But what I'm keen to understand is, clearly, it's a very challenging time for small businesses at the moment. The last five years has just been absolutely unprecedented. But despite that, you've all done brilliant things with really innovative and exciting products, services, and initiatives. So I'd really love to hear a bit more around how have you taken your kind of nugget, your seed of an idea, and then managed to scale it in the way that you have. So maybe, David, if I can pick on sure, you first. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, our, our founders, Elliot Street and Jordan Van Flute, um, 10 years ago started the company from their bedroom. Um, and actually, one was a med student, Elliot, and Jordan was a philosophy student. And, and they, they actually spent a long, long time trying to ensure early profitability. And so throughout really the course of the, of the growth of our company, 
um, we've, we've maintained that. And, and our current product that we, we had upstairs, which is the, our flagship augmented reality laparoscopic simulator, was built out of a 500K government grant um, and maintained profitability throughout. So really, the, the key lines are staying lean, ensuring that we had um, robust and resilient manufacturing, as well as also, um, you know, and this is something that probably we'll, we'll talk about lots today, but listening to the customer. And obviously, we had a conundrum where we're two, in between two different types of customer, the industry and also the surgeons. So having to listen to that and also finding a balance between the two was, was definitely a challenge for us. Brilliant. And how about yourself? How, how has your initiative grown to the extent that it has? So, funny story. Um, last year, City, my co-founder and I, we drove to Ascot from London for a documentary that was filmed by the Founding Network. And it was supposed to be a one hour journey, and it took us three hours. Lots of wrong turns, wrong exits at a roundabout, then there was a hailstorm, then there was a rainbow, and we were still one hour away from London. In that moment, City said, man, this feels like building my hangry. <laughs> it was honestly um, a summary and a metaphor of how the past three years since our existence, we launched in 2019, um, had been because we launched a platform for social gatherings, helping people host friends at home just before the pandemic hit. So anyway, um, a very long story short, I guess, um, we then grew from two founders working as a side hustle on the business whilst we were in sales and trading to then quitting our jobs, growing the team to 18. And yeah, now we are where we are and we can go into more detail about other things after. Amazing. 2 to 18 is massive in, in such a short amount of time, it's brilliant. So we've heard a bit about business profitability, the relentless focus on that, keeping it lean. What would you say, and I apologise for the pun, is the recipe for success for that growth? <laughs> Definitely staying lean. Um, I think that's just, I think the lean startup is such a widely known book, so I don't want to actually speak about it too much, but um, making sure there's a zero budget policy for anything you approach and making sure that um, as founders, you know every part of the business. So David already mentioned listening to the customer and one of the mistakes that we did that prevented the success that we've had this year actually was that we had hired um, a head of customer success and we had hired a few customer success managers and instead of speaking to the customer ourselves as an early stage business, the founders need to be listening to the customers all the time. We had outsourced that to other people so we can get on with financials and all of these things that take time and require focused work. And during the time when we were part of Y Combinator's um, uh, batch beginning of the year, we were told off for having done that. So we actually had to sadly let go of those people and that has led us to having a much quicker feedback loop, whether that was for product and iterating the product and making it better, or for growth by learning who our target audience is quicker and finding ways to reach them by using new growth channels. Yeah, spot on. I mean, and it's the same at large organizations as well. We make sure there's time to really spend time with our customers and also our non-customers so that we can understand why they're not, what do we need to do differently? absolutely spot on it's invaluable and for you what's, yes. your, what's the journey been so i was inspired by my taiwanese american heritage uh, to start humanity it's inspired by bubble tea and bubble tea originated in taiwan uh, so i started selling on in farmers market three years ago so i was making everything by hand i was renting a commercial kitchen uh, working hours from midnight to 6 a.m and then going to the market at 9 a.m so it's like quite a taxing uh, one year that I was selling in farmer's markets. But it was a good experience to get customer feedback face-to-face. Mm -hmm. -face. I could sample and then um, make the recipe better based on feedback from the customers. And once I had the right recipe, uh, I did a crowdfunding campaign, an equity-free one. So we did a pre-sale and we raised enough money for our first production. Mm -hmm. And that's when I launched an online website in 2020 and then started selling into retail stores in 2021. And then recently have launched on Ocado. And we're going to do our third production run soon as well. Amazing, that's really exciting. So to be honest, the ingredient there, it sounds like is just hard work, just relentlessly <sighs> championing the product and making sure that you're engaging with customers. And for yourself, what's the journey been? Yeah, I think um, <clears throat> there's a level of irony in that social proof has helped us and that we set our sights high. 
and we're lucky to work with the very group quite early on, so a big retailer, and through that we're able to acquire a lot more customers. So when someone hears that you work with a big brand, they want to know why and they want a lot more interested. So having done that, uh, worked at other companies and you know, when you have those pinnacle brands, it really does help you. And I think um, also being very flexible in our product, that we adapted it very quickly. Um, and also I think making a product, especially in SaaS, very easy to use mm -hmm. and to be able to be in implemented very quickly. So people are seeing impact and it's something that they can test and really see the value very fast rather than taking a long time to implement and lots of people need to get trained, etc. cetera. Mm -hmm. So aim high maybe is the message there. Absolutely, go for yeah. the big guys and go for it. Yeah. Exactly. Cool. So at the moment there's a lot of discussion around what does, what does growth mean? What is growth? And we know there's obviously a number of different government initiatives focused on help to grow. What, what does growth mean for you guys? What, how, how do you invest in your growth? How, how, for people in the audience who might be kind of setting up a small business themselves or thinking about it, what are some of those in ingredients or considerations for you? What does it mean? Maybe if I come to you first. Yep. Um, so at the moment for us, uh, growth is uh, expansion into the US. Mm -hmm. um, that's a massive opportunity for us. Um, you know, having working with similar brands in the UK and then kind of it's a very similar model. Um, and big businesses over there are five, ten times the size of the UK. So it's massive for us, and we've just signed uh, GoPro and Michael Kors. So again, using exactly. social proof, you know, you can kind of go to a lot of other businesses. Um, so we're, we're starting to hire and develop, which is really exciting, um, and also expand into uh, Europe, and also expand the product as well. So mm -hmm. expand it into uh, recommendations um, and make the messaging tailor to the business requirements a bit more. Um, but I think that at the moment for us, the US yeah. is the biggest focus, really. But it sounds like, I mean, there you've talked about kind of growing teams, you've talked about growing capabilities, growing market. <coughs> how, how do you plan for that? How do you? Um, it's very, we're quite reactive, which is great. I think that, um, you know, we, the, the product we've created has obviously gone from a lot of feedback from clients, which yeah. I think is very important, is that someone will sometimes say, can you do this? And we say, can we, can we not? Shall we build it? Yeah, yeah. Um, so that's really important as well. Um, but I also think that you know, hiring is, is a massive, like, it's very hard, everyone knows, but hiring the right people um, and investing time can really help grow the business the right way. Yeah, brilliant. What about yourself, Tina? How are you thinking about it? Yeah, so I'm thinking for small businesses in the audience, uh, how I would put growth is you would set goals and try to reach those goals. And for us, um, this year in 2023, our goal is to get into more markets outside of UK. So we're speaking with markets in the rest of Europe, so France, and also Middle East and Asia as well. And we've also recently spoken with the Mexican market. So we're looking at opportunities to enter high-end department stores and high-end uh, retail supermarkets in these areas. And we're also looking to come up with a new flavor, so a new product development. Right now we have a matcha flavor, an Earl Grey flavor, and the third flavor would be a turmeric one. Mm -hmm. So I think Very just nice. growing, I think growth uh, is based on however businesses want to measure it. Yeah. So it, not to always compare it with other businesses. Yeah. But I mean, again, it sounds like you've got so many different things to consider there. How do you, all of these different markets, how, how are you prioritizing it? How are you, what's your approach? Mm, so it's quite clear for us because it's export and new product and um, like you like you mentioned uh, how do we prioritize so in Middle East market they have seen the most interested mm -hmm. so we're going to focus on the Middle East market first and then we've also had strong interest from France so those are the two markets we'll focus on first nice exciting and how about yourself this is so exciting because Tina and I met at Google for Startups in 2019 when we both had started. Amazing. And it's so amazing to hear how, obviously, like, the business has grown. No, I'm so inspired <laughs> by you, yes. Go so female, <laughs> founder. So you pat my shoulder. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, I think in terms of growth, I'll separate maybe into two areas. One um, being business growth and then personal growth. I think as a business, um, why Hangry in particular, we have a product that is inherently viral. You don't have, well, if you have meal prep, that's different, but you might enjoy it in your office. Um, but we are a business where you will enjoy a dinner, a brunch, or a 
wedding reception with your friends. So at each event, there are an average 10 people who find out about Why Hangry. So we measure growth on the demand side as how many diners experience Why Hangry. So mm -hmm. to date, we've cooked for more than 40,000 diners in the UK. And um, on the supply side, we measure how many chefs we have on the platform who are active and who are making a significant amount of additional income through Why Hangry. And that's more than 500 at the moment. And we hope to grow these two. And as a two-sided marketplace, we have the typical marketplace um, disbalances. We have too many chefs. They don't get enough jobs. And then we have <laughs> too little chefs. And it's like, oh, let's get more chefs. So it's um, growing both sides. Um, uh, at the same time. Personally, I think um, growth comes with feeling out of my depth, feeling some level of discomfort, um, whether that is in a difficult conversation with my co-founder or with my partner, or whether that is, um, so I recently got my own horse and yesterday actually I fell off for the first time. So the seal is all ripped and I had to get off, get on immediately, although I was a little bit shocked. So it's kind of a discomfort, okay, I have to do this. It does, it's not easy, but I can do this and it will help me grow. Af like after that process of pushing yourself helps you grow. So um, that's how I think about it um, personally, although actually, Sometimes that translates into business too, because sometimes, especially when you're still finding product market fit, you have to make um, a lot of product changes. Some of them might be risky and lead to a few days of no revenue where you think, oh my God, what have I done? And then you realize, oh, okay, there were a few bugs, few issues that iron them out and then things start working and, they, and you end up growing faster than you had prior to making that change that ended up in feeling like you just jumped off a cliff. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think it's such an important point that like confidence is such an underrated element of growing a business. And I think it's part of the reason why through the work that we're doing through our Lloyds Bank Academy and our Bank of Scotland Academy, we're trying to make sure that we're, yes, providing people with help and support, funding, skills, you know, open sourcing some of the learning and management training that we've got bringing in tech partners to give some of that tech support, but ultimately connecting people with other people so that you can have great conversations like this and also realize you know, we all make mistakes and actually, as you say, those are the things that make you get back on the horse and think about things slightly differently, which is, which is a brilliant message and a brilliant lesson, I think. How about for yourself? I'm glad you're okay, by the way. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, just slightly like bruised yeah. and a little bit sore. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's literally, you know, you know, they knock me down, but I'll get up again. That's, that's, that <laughs> that's song, exactly what yeah, happened. That's good. It's really good. <laughs> I mean, I mean I, you know, apart from the things that we've all mentioned, which is, you know, aiming to double your revenue year on year, aiming to grow into new markets and um, building your products, securing patents, which is really key, and, and, and really protecting your IP and looking for collaborations. I think the growth mindset that we, that we try and focus on in Innovus is, you know, we look at ESG as not just being an environmental thing, we look at the S and the G, and we, that's kind of forgotten because of that lovely marketing term that's being coined by the VCs. And um, as much as I love it, I think there has to be a focus on S and G, and part of that is looking at nurturing your own workforce. So, so obviously finding that talent and, yeah. and, and securing that talent, but also nurturing that talent. So what we have at Innovus is kind of some new things that we've established, which is, um, budgets for, for everyone to go on courses to learn new things, whether it's coding that you want to learn or potentially some me mechanical engineering, um, you know, we can, we can potentially find um, budgets for that. And we're obviously doing it in a way where, you know, you have to be on top of your KPIs if you're, if you're <laughs> going to be going down that route, obviously. But, um, but certainly even taking a step back from that, we've got obviously a, a, an augmented reality approach. So that means there's real organs that we're making in a, in a, in a, in a, a, ra a lab, basically in a room. And as a result, we've got special effects, um, uh, film engineers and, and, and um, people that come out straight from graduation that don't have jobs in their ideal industry, in the film industry. And rather than going to work at, you know, say Starbucks or something like that for practically minimum wage, we, we provide them an opportunity to further and bolster their CV, whilst also allowing them the practically zero notice that they might get for a film, we allow them to go and get involved in those things. So as a result, we've had some, um, we've been given some awards from our local council in St. Helens um, for, for really looking after the local population. And that's, 
that's really what I wanted to focus on, that growth mindset. You mentioned it and you touched on it, but allowing, and, and allowing that growth mindset to be infectious amongst the entire um, staff that we have uh, at Innovus. So, so it's really it's about nurturing the next generation of people that are taking the potentially C-suite roles or even higher, or even going into other um, businesses and other jobs. We want them to be better than they were when they joined us. So I hope that helps. Yeah, no, definitely. And I think it goes back to what you were saying about, you know, expanding into new markets. You need the talent, you need the people in order to get there. And the reality is, is the world of technology is moving so quickly, we need to invest in upskilling and supporting people and giving them that confidence and capability. So, you know, we've already been talking about, is it, you know, some of our apprentices, how might we kind of share those? What does that look like? How do we make sure that we're kind of collectively investing in a more kind of tech focused and inclusive workforce for the future so it's exciting to think about future collaboration in that space as well so we don't have too much time left but i wondered whether given some of the brilliant people that we've got in the room today firstly if you had any advice for any um, would-be startups and founders in the room but also thinking about the fact that there's likely to be you know other large corporates and organizations here here today what are some of the things that you would ask of some of the, the, the big companies that you're starting to work with that could help you and other small businesses more? Big questions, I know. Yeah. <laughs> so maybe if I can come to you sure. first. I think um, looking at the general market, we're, we're, it's, things are uncertain. And, and certainly as we grow, we'll be looking for series funding, you know, A, B, C, et cetera. And I think some of the things that we want to look for from VCs is, is not just that check. It's not just the money, because you know, as, as we spoke about Raj earlier today, money is available everywhere. Um, it's really about where the money's coming from and what they're providing around that money. And I think, obviously, I think naturally, because the way the economy is moving, VCs are taking their time to vet. They are, they're, they're getting more involved with the whole process. Um, and it would be good to hear, really, from, from, the, from the start, what is it that you can provide other than just money, so that we're able to then think about those things and, and, and take them home. And you had another aspect of your question as well, didn't you? Uh, advice. Advice, advice yeah. to give back. Well, I, I guess, I guess that you know the most important thing is to is to stop and take stock. You know, it's it's, it's not it's not um, awkward or, or, or dangerous to say no. Uh, you know, can I think about that? And I think um, a lot of people are, are are rushing or maybe maybe making decisions based on you know the excitement of seeing. Um, a particular opportunity. So I think it's just to you know, take things slow and to really analyze things as much as possible. Uh, a bit like playing chess, really. Brilliant. Thank you. Yourself? I would maybe go against the taking it slow, but I think there's a fine <laughs> balance. <Of course>. Because <laughs> <laughs> I think um, when City and I started Why Hangry, when we were still working in finance and doing things kind of as a side hustle, it was, and even now, our um, speed of execution, we try to be extremely fast whilst maintaining a quality just about high enough that customers don't look at the website and realize, oh, what the hell is this? Uh, but rather, when we launch new features, we want to get it out there. We want to see the hard data of whether people click on it, whether people convert, and then we either discard it or we decide to put resources in and actually make it better. And that is where the slow process actually comes in. But the initial, I think at least in our stage, I think Innovus has been around for a bit longer, and naturally um, it'll, it needs a bit more consideration. That's kind of how we're approaching things. So if um, anyone here is looking to start a business, I would recommend A, things we've mentioned, being super lean, being super close to the customer, to make changes, take that feedback um, instantly, but also um, execute very quickly and focus on one thing at a time, test and discard, or test and validate and build it out. Brilliant, thank you. Tina? Yeah, so I'm part of this program called uh, SUUK, Social Enterprise UK, and their goal is to actually speak with corporates and encourage them to buy from companies with social purposes. And I think uh, that's very important because large corporations, they have a big spending budget. So they can, instead of buying from the likes of Coca-Cola, they can buy from a smaller company like Humanity with a positive social value. And then in terms of advice for founders, uh, my experience is that it's also very important to take time for yourself. Mm -hmm. And I found that I had burnout at some point where like I was working really late nights 
and I was getting really tired and I actually burned myself literally mm -hmm. with hot water. Ooh. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so I say like find that time for yourself um, so that you can have uh, well-being and also um, yeah, take that tea break to yeah. find mindfulness. Definitely a tea break, a <laughs> humanity break, yes. love that. Yeah. Um, I'd, I'd say um, in terms of when you're growing um, people, we mentioned about it before, but people is, is so important if you have the right people around you. Um, not anything, but a lot of things become a lot easier. Um, and having worked at startups before, when you had a strong team, you know, you moved a lot faster and, and having a collective belief in what you're doing. And, and to your point as well, being reactive and very agile because things change. You have a great idea and all of a sudden you realize that, you know what, maybe that isn't right. And sometimes being quite rigid is, is the opposite of what you want to do. Um, and things change and I think you've just got to kind of follow what has, uh, you can see success in. Um, but I think in the beginning stages for me in startups, it's always been the team. When you have the right team, I've seen progression and, and really speedy growth. Yeah, that's brilliant. Thank you. I think, as you've all said today consistently, it's about people. It's about the end user, the customer. It's about the people that you're working with. And as you said, I think that's a great point around, you know, checking in on yourself and recognising how much you're achieving with so many different considerations and priorities. So a big thank you for joining the panel today. And for anyone in the audience, if you want to hear more about what we're doing to support small businesses or if you want to have a conversation about inclusive tech and design, which are some of our big passions, then do get in touch. But please give them a round of applause for sharing this. <laughs>